Hello and welcome to Culture Night. My name is John Mee and I'll be reading to you from my pamphlet From the Extinct. Paperweight. The Gaelic poets were kept in their place, a rock on the chest to teach them to breathe, other men's songs weighing on their hearts, passing through them to be born on their backs. They added nothing until the words they mouthed were safely on the wind. Dry leaves blowing about the green land, a few new lines at the bitter end. This poem is in three parts and has an epigraph. Cheb, Duke Albrecht von Wallenstein, Imperial General of the Thirty Years' War, was once Europe's most powerful man. He was suspected of treachery by Emperor Ferdinand II and was assassinated by Irish officers in his army in what is now the Czech Republic. 1938. Hitler has followed the Wehrmacht to Cheb to visit the scene of the murder of Wallenstein, to promise on the street of crooked houses, never again shall the land of your futures be torn from the Reich. In Pathé newsreels, soldiers in the streets walk on flowers. Peasant girls dance. Small boys peek past boots and rifles. A Sudeten woman in an archive photograph gives a raised arm salute. Half her face covered in a white handkerchief. She is crying. Later the Americans crop the photo Remove the friends beside her. An older woman, one glove off, the other in a leather coat, laughing as they salute. 1634. When all things were sure at the castle, up came the supper, a very stately one, with wine and other junkets, snails and pike. Butler played upon them with jests in Gaelic, which none of them understood. Many healths went round and merrily. This time, said Butler, I will begin, and being a great cop, spoke to Count Kinsky, said it should be the Emperor's health. The Count scorned to pledge and damned Vienna. Butler threw the cup and drink in his face and with a stiletto stabbed him. He called in a loud voice, Viva Ferdinando, whereupon stepped in the musketeers at either door and the nobility were slain, pages and all. Butler and his Irish with naked swords reaching the marketplace where Wallenstein lay struck down two gentlemen of his chamber. Wallenstein cried out he would hang the bestia that made such a noise in the night. Walter Devereux, being a strong, lusty man, running at the door with his foot bursted open. Wallenstein reached for his pistols on the wall. But Devereux, at his coming, cried, Sa, 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 traitor thou must die. Devereux pierced him with his halberd. He fell to the ground, gave a great groan, as if the devil had gone out of him. Butler presently drew him out by the heels, his head knocking upon every stair, all bloody. 1990. They wave machine guns in my face, at first light, on the border at Cheb. 
I'm talking about Kafka as they haul me off the train. I won't see Prague. There's a food stall, wasps behind the glass, crawling on the cakes. In the station master's office, I point to my chest, Irish. The old man shakes his head, shows me a print on the wall. Soldiers rushing in like ancient firemen, plumed hats and high boots. All their swords point at the heart of a man who stands at the side. His left hand is raised to show he has nothing up his sleeve. Jabbing his finger, the station master says, Irish, then laughs. Travel light. Pack everything you need and throw away half. Let's see what you've got. Luminescent, incandescent, evanescent. How long are you going for? And all this, sparkling, flickering, shimmering. What were you thinking of? At the bottom, some heavier bits and bobs. Longing falling, yearning. You can get those anywhere. Cheaper too. Zipped in a pocket. A ton salon. Put that away or you'll lose it. So it's empty now. You wouldn't have got far. Burden. The next life will be like the one they knew and they will need many things. Ebony boxes with cedar panels, turquoise and jasper, myrrh and moringa oil. They will make their denials to green-skinned Osiris, prompted by the Book of the Dead. I have not brought forth tears. It was not I who caused pain and hunger. When hearts are weighed, theirs will be lighter than truth. Soul and body will be kept together, safe from the crocodile jaws of Amit, eater of bones. Beyond the lake of the jackal, in the reed fields of Hetep, there will be crops to sow, water courses to fill with water, the sands of the east to carry to the west. But when the overseers come, to seek what is due from the great. The little carved shabti will spring to life, offer to serve in their place, take on the burden. Girl. I didn't know punks collected stamps, I said. Fuck you, said the boy with blue hair, looking up from a bin bag full of corners torn from envelopes. He was Kenny, and she was Liz, and I wasn't to mind him. Her smile was crowded with crooked teeth, like a stamp with double print that makes it really valuable. Your life is shit, was scrawled in her coat, and there was a silver ball on her tongue. We were sorting stamps for Malcolm in the curiosity shop, among the broken statues of the Blessed Virgin. I wanted to tell her about Heinrich Girl and his Celtic designs that won a prize. This poor sod, said Kenny, is a worker. He had the brown two-piece stamp, a little dog, each leg a triangle, feet twirly brackets, his head turned to chew his tail. There's millions like him, Kenny said, and Malcolm thinks he's worthless. Every day in his chains and red and white tartan trousers, Kenny talked about Marx and a band called Crass and Guy de Boer. When I asked who that was, he said I'd find out 
when I stopped being 10. I said, I'm 15 next week, and Malcolm says your dad's a judge. Liz laughed, or coughed maybe, and he turned red and went out for a smoke. She said, I see them in my sleep, the dog and the eagle and the deer, but the one that really messes with my head is the flying yellow cow. I fished around in the bag to find the 10p with the purple background, quickly because Kenny would be back, and I passed it to her like a cigarette or a note. The winged ox from the Book of Litchfield, symbol of John the Evangelist, and she held it up to the light. In this next poem, I predict the pandemic. Expat. Warm rain and gin slings on the roof of the bank tower. I eat the red apple meant for show. My visitors talk about Blade Runner and dystopia. Fly on to Australia. Hats off for the temperature check. Butterfly flu at the airport and docks. The sick wear the same masks as the well. I uncover the lips of a stranger. At the goldfish market, the merchandise mouths help from plastic bags. This next poem has a run-on title. Zoonoses are what we catch from animals, even our pets, when we lean too close, breathe in what they breathe out. Our noses twitch, too long chained down, they get the itch to swap places with a proboscis, trunk or snout. Before my wife can shout, Leave the cat alone, for Christ's sake. Puka has my rhinitis, and I'm smelling the world in HD, head exploding with grassy memory, new tail swishing. As Puka powers up my laptop to check the Guardian, I'm out in the garden, pissing on a tree. Showdown. I was not even of the same nature as man. I was more agile. Frankenstein. At Chamonix on the Mer de Glace, Frankenstein meets his monster. Among swaying alpine trees, the creature says, Look in the mirror. You can't win facing your monster, his leaden eyes, crooked smile, cobbled together from the dead, he fights like a master. All bolts and scars, he matches your moves, kicks, spins, soars. You can't give up, you dream of taking him apart. Starting again. Saturday night. When Finbar's angel blows her trumpets, from imagined corners, the earth folds up. The living come from narrow houses to stand against the reclaiming dead. Holy murder in Barrack Street rain in the air, the old wind carries curses down the lanes. Never again Sunday morning to light on glass, blood and limping dogs. Go the back way, down the steps to the river, come and find me. <laughs>